number 218. It is a real blessing to be able to be here tonight in be able to share with you in some time of service to our great God in heaven. I'm very thankful for this meeting. I'm thankful for the brethren here who have asked us to come and to help and be a part of your work during this week. You know, I have such wonderful memories of 21st Street. One of the very first meetings I ever held, and maybe the first one I ever held, was here at 21st Street in 1977. If you will do the math, that is 47 years ago. Now, I'm sure that was probably on four or five when we held that meeting, being so long ago. But it's just hard to believe time has flown so quickly. And a lot of folks that were here back then have passed on or perhaps have moved away. And it's almost like a sort of a newer congregation here with a lot of younger families. And again, a lot of old familiar friends and faces that I see as well. So I'm thankful to be here tonight. I want to uh, also commend those who have led us in worship so far. I want to thank Brother Allen for his prayer tonight. He took us to the very throne of grace and talked to our God in our behalf. And I want to thank our brothers who have led the songs tonight. You also have lifted our spirits up. You've helped us to worship our great God in spirit and in truth. And I commend you for that. And I thank you for that as well. The city of Jerusalem during Jesus' day was an international city. What that means is it wasn't just Jews that lived there. People from all over the world lived in Jerusalem during the days of Jesus. In fact, the story is tell us that about two-thirds of the inhabitants of Jerusalem was Jew, Jews, and one-third of the inhabitants of Jerusalem would be Gentiles. Now, these Gentiles would come from various places, obviously, to work and to make money. But there were also several Romans living in Jerusalem during that time because Jerusalem was an occupied city. And Rome wanted to take care of themselves, so they had their official there. Now, the city of Jerusalem during the day of Jesus was basically divided into two large sections, maybe a little more, but at least two large sections. One section is called the lower city. We'll talk more about this tomorrow night when we talk a lot more about Jerusalem. But the lower city was the part where the Jews basically lived. It was the poor side of town. Uh, The Jews were very wealthy back in those days, and they basically scraped to get by. But it was full of Jewish people in the lower city. The upper city was the place where the Gentiles and the Romans and the rich, aristocratic Jews lived. In fact, if you made a trip to the upper city, you would find that it looked a whole lot like Rome because there were places there built with Roman architecture. People dressed a lot like Romans. One spring morning, one of these Roman officials was walking through the streets of Jerusalem and heard a commotion just outside the city walls. And he stopped the Jew walking beside him. He said, what's going on? What's that noise going on outside the walls? And the Jewish man said, haven't you heard Jesus is coming here today. And the Roman man asked him, the official asked him, and who is Jesus? And he says, you heard of Jesus. Jesus, we believe, is our Messiah. Now that immediately got the interest of this Roman official because he had heard a little about the Romans, about the Jewish Messiah. He was believed to be the king of the Jews. Now being a Roman official, he was interested to see what exactly what was going on here. So he decided to go outside the gates of the city, and see what the commotion was himself. As he was walking through the crowded streets of Jerusalem, he began to reflect back upon the times in Rome when he had seen the conquering generals come into Rome. And he remembered the power and the spectacle that was there on those, that situation. He remembered the Roman generals generally came in first, riding a chariot, being pulled by either four beautiful black stallions or or white stallions as well. Behind this conquering general would come the plunder that they had captured. Behind the plunder would come the slaves that they had captured who would now become slaves in Jerusalem. 
And after the slaves came the Roman soldiers. Now the people greeted them enthusiastically. History tells us that they they burned incense and the air was filled with the delicious aroma of burning incense. They were casting flowers in front of this Roman general. And so it was really a spectacle, a spectacle of sheer power and wealth. Well, as the Roman official walks outside the walls of Jerusalem, he wonders if he's going to see the same thing. He joins with a group of people outside the walls, and he sees that they begin to make this trek up the Mount of the Walls. And as he's walking with this group from the, uh, up the Mount of Olives, he sees another group coming down the other side, coming from the top of the Mount of Olives, down toward where they are, and they're just about to meet. Now, as they're walking along, people are taking their garments off, some of their garments off, and they're putting them down on the ground. And they're waving palm branches, and they're putting these palm branches down on the ground inside of them. He sees the object of the whole thing going here. He sees, to his surprise, a man sitting on a small donkey, surrounded by common people. But not only does he see a man sitting on a small donkey, he looks closer and he sees that this man has been crying. This man on this donkey, whom everyone is paying attention to, has been crying. And he sort of looks around, and instead of seeing soldiers, he sees a bunch of poor people, a bunch of common people. Instead of seeing a general riding on some war horse or being fooled by some team that's pulling a chariot, he sees this humble looking man sitting on a small donkey. And instead of seeing a man that, that exudes power and authority, he sees a man that seems to be just full of meekness. And so he looks at that for a second, shakes his head, and walks away. And says to himself, you've got it. That is their king. That is their Messiah. If that's the best they can do for a Messiah, then they're in big trouble. Thus begins the story of the Lord's royal, the king's royal entrance into, into uh, Jerusalem. Let me see if I can get this. Now, I find it interesting that when when the uh, when the Roman official walked away and said, "Is this the best that you can come up with?" He's not the only one that said things like that or thought things like that as well. The Bible describes one of uh, well, you're going to have to bear with me as uh, I get used to technology here. About 700 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. God allowed the prophet Isaiah to look down the stream of time and see the future. And when Isaiah was allowed to look down the stream of time, he was able to see Jesus suffering, and he was able to see the death of Jesus. And he wrote about it in the last few verses of Isaiah chapter 52 and all of Isaiah chapter 53. I want you to notice what Isaiah the prophet says about Jesus. He says this in Isaiah 53 verse 2. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. That Roman official saw no beauty in Jesus as far as being a political leader. A lot of the Jews as well rejected Jesus because, you see, they didn't see in him what they wanted. They didn't see the conquering king that he wanted to be. Well, this evening, we begin a series of studies on the Passion Week. And the Passion Week is the week of the Lord's life, just before he dies on the cross. And it's called the Passion Week, not because the word passion there refers to desire. It actually refers to suffering. And so we're going to call this the Suffering Week as well, because Jesus is going to be involved with suffering here. Now, the Bible tells us some important things about this last week of the Lord's life. The Bible tells us that before creation, before God ever created this world, God promised a Savior. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, 
Bible there says that Jesus was a lamb foreordained before the creation of the world. So before the world ever created, God planned the death of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, the Bible there makes another promise. In fact, this is believed to be the very first, uh, very first promise of the Messiah as far as recorded and all. And Genesis 3 verse 15, it was told that he would, the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent. The first promise of the coming of Jesus, and it would involve his death, and it would involve his resurrection. But the Bible continues on. The Bible talks about the uh, Passover lamb. You remember in Exodus chapter 12, and the Passover lamb also pointed forward to the cross of Christ. And then there was a day of atonement. The day of atonement also pointed forward to the day of Jesus coming as well. Now, the Passion Week is going to describe the fulfillment of all of these great promises found in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament as well. All of these promises for God's plan to redeem the earth and to save man from sin, they're going to be found and be fulfilled during the Passion Week, and especially during the last part of the Passion Week, during the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, I want to present a little uh, kind of timeline for you here that will show you where we're going this week. We're going to be, in a sense, kind of following Jesus this week. And our study today involves a triumphal entry, and that takes place on a Sunday. Now, the next day, we're going to see that Jesus will cleanse the temple. That's on a Monday. Then on a Tuesday, there will be the day of controversy where the enemies of the Jews will take turns trying to shame and humiliate him. On Wednesday, there seems to be kind of a quiet day. But on this day, Judas will agree to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. On Thursday, we will find the Last Supper recorded and Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. On Friday, there will be the crucifixion of Jesus. Saturday, his body will be in the tomb. And Sunday will be the resurrection. This is the direction we're going this week. We're going to go by this week and follow the Lord as he goes through this various place. Now, one thing that I found kind of interesting in thinking about this is that it kind of sort of parallels with the uh, creation week. Not that they're exactly parallel, but it's interesting that in the creation week, there are seven days that are involved in creation. Of course, God rested on the seventh day, but we call that the creation week. The Passion Week also is actually eight days as far as we're using it, beginning on a Sunday and ending on a Sunday. Both of these weeks are the two most important weeks, perhaps, in redemptive history. Because, first of all, it begins with the creation of life. Life was created. But secondly, in the Passion Week, this is the creation of forgiveness. Again, the offer of life for man to be forgiven of his sins. And it all comes about through the death of Jesus. Now, with all this in mind, we want to turn now to the uh, royal interest, the king's royal interest. It's kind of interesting how presidents and kings are introduced in public settings. If the president of the United States made an appearance here in Oklahoma City, there are certain things that we will do. We will, of course, protect him from all kinds of harm, but when he makes his appearance, a band will play hell to the chief, and then the people will clap for him. You know, the kings and queens of England have the same kind of protocol. Whenever they make a public appearance, something similar will happen. They will sing the national anthem, God Save the King, and God Save the Queen, depending on who's in power at that time. And if it's located somewhat close to where they live, there are those who will blow the trumpets and will announce the coming of the king or the queen. Now, I think it's going to be interesting for us to study the entrance of Jesus. When King Jesus comes to Jerusalem, how is he going to be received? Now, in order to go through our study, I think we need to back up a little bit, do a little bit of history here, and help us to see the background of what's going on. That's a very simple little map, very crude little map, but hopefully it's going to help you and me to understand what's happening during the royal coming of Jesus, the royal entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. This is the route of the triumphant entry. 
Now, a few days before this, Jesus had been making his way toward Jerusalem, and he arrived at the city of Jericho. Remember at Jericho? That's where he met uh, that's where he met Bartimaeus, the blind man, and others as well. But he left the city of Jericho and made his way up to Bethany. Bethany would be about five or six hours of walking time. It's believed that Jesus probably reached Bethany either Friday or perhaps sometimes Saturday. Saturday evening, it's believed that he was invited to the house of Simon the leper. It is at the house of Simon the leper that Mary comes and anoints him with a very costly ointment. And it's there that Judah says, hey, we could have sold that to the poor. And she said, she, and we could have sold that and got a lot of money out of it and gave it to the poor. And here she's wasting all of this stuff, showing his true colors. Well, it's the next morning. And it's believed to be Sunday where Jesus will make his way from Bethany uh, to Bethphage, Bethphage. Now, this is on the Mount of Olives. And Bethany and Bethphage are on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. In other words, they can't see over the top there. They can't see Jerusalem where they are. So they have to go ahead and climb up, ascend the rest of the mountain, get on top of the mountain, and then start their way down. And that's what they're going to do. Jesus is going to find himself going to Bethphage, Bethphage, if you pronounce it correctly. And at that point, that they're going to find the little mule, the little donkey, for him to ride in. Now, when he comes to Jerusalem, he's going to find a city that is packed to the gills with people because it's Passover time. And people from all over the world have come to uh, to enjoy the Passover. In fact, Bible scholars believe that the city of Jerusalem is about five times more crowded now than it was. Kind of like some of these little cities a couple of days ago with the eclipse going through. You know, some of these little cities in Texas, some other places, had this big riotous of people come in because of the, of the eclipse. They wanted to see it. Sometimes two or three times more the normal population all crowded into that city to see the eclipse. Well, they have come from all over the world, basically the Jews have, from all over the world to be there to be a part of the, uh, the Passover. Jesus is going to find a place that is excited. People are buzzing. And you know the reason that they're excited and they're buzzing. And in fact, the tension in that city is so thick that you cut up the night. And you know why it is that way? Why people are so excited and people are so full of anticipation because in Luke chapter 19, just a few verses before our text that we're going to read, the Bible says this, Luke chapter 19, verse 11. Now, as they heard these things, he spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. Let that soak in. They thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. People thought that the kingdom was going to happen right now. So they were all excited. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, he did so with a price on his head. As far as I mean, Jewish religious, religious leaders are concerned, he was public enemy number one. Not only did he come in with a price on his head, he came in with a bullet on his chest. Because just a few weeks before this, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. And the Jews were so angry at that. And they were so concerned now that the Romans were going to take in and take away their power that they got together and they decided, we've got to do something. And the high priest came up with a wonderful plan. So they thought, let's kill one man. All we got to do is kill one man for the whole nation. And so when Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he is a marked man. Now, he could have chosen to come in quiet. He could have chosen to just join in with all the other pilgrims coming into the city. And maybe no one would have noticed it. But he didn't choose to do that. Jesus came in boldly, loudly for people to see him. It's in a sense almost like Jesus was throwing down the God. I have a reason for coming in like this, he seems to be saying. There is a purpose here. Now, you Jews are wanting to kill me. But I'm not going to let you kill me the way you want to. I'm not going to let you trap me in some dark alley back here and kill me. You're going to kill me, as Scripture says. You're going to crucify me. You're going to kill me publicly. Now, the Jews think they're the ones calling the shots. They think they're the ones that are making the plans that are going to be successful, and they get rid of Jesus. But little do they realize that they are nothing more than pawns in the hand of God. 
What Jesus is going to accomplish is what he wants to do. It's his will, not their will at all. Now, with this thought in mind, I want to begin going through Luke chapter 19. We're going to study Luke chapter 19 and use that as our, our basis for our study. Now, the account is found in the other three gospel narratives, in Matthew, Mark, and John, but we're going to use Luke. And what we're going to do in our study is we're going to take some of the facts from these other three and bring them into this passage. You know, when Scripture has parallel passages, a lot of times you don't find all the truth in one passage. Kind of like the plan of salvation. You know, you don't find everything in the plan of salvation in one Scripture. You've got to examine other Scriptures as well. And to get the truth concerning Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem, we've got to blend these four gospel accounts together. We're going to use Luke to do so. And what we'll do is we'll just bring in Matthew or Mark or John from time to time. Now the passage begins like this. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethany, Bethany, remember where he said those were, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a cold pie on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has needed it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. That as they were loosening the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosening the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. I don't know about you, but for a long time I always wondered, how did they pull this off? How did they walk into Jerusalem and find this donkey and get the donkey and some guy stopped and all they said was the Lord had to need but and how did they get away with this? Well, I'm convinced that probably there was some prearranging that had gone on here. This fellow who owned the donkey knew what was going to happen somehow. Perhaps Jesus had taught him at some earlier point. Whatever the case may be, there seems to be a prearrangement here when they found the donkey. They immediately brought it back to Jesus. He sat on the donkey and began to make his way toward Jerusalem. You know, looking at this passage, I think that there are four great truths that I want to mention that come out of this pretty quickly. Number one, the passage fulfills Old Testament prophecy. In Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, the prophet said that the king would enter Jerusalem on the back of the donkey. And what's interesting is that Luke doesn't record. He doesn't refer to that prophecy. Matthew and John do, but Luke doesn't. But we know that it's there. And we know what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is showing his love for the Old Testament Scripture. He's showing his belief and trust in the Old Testament Scriptures. Jesus understood how valuable these Scriptures were, and he honored those Scriptures. And he's going to do everything those Scriptures said, indicating to us that we too, should honor and love the scriptures as well. That's not all. Not only does uh, not only does this teach the fulfillment of prophecy, but it also is a little something that we call symbolic action. You know, especially among the Old Testament prophets, they didn't just preach their sermons. They also acted their sermons out. Now, you know, the more of your human senses that you can involve in learning, the more you're going to learn. And if you can see something, and hear something that's better than just hearing something. The prophet Jeremiah, for example, would walk around the streets of Jerusalem and preach to the people that they needed to surrender to the Babylonians. This was God's will. Give it up. Surrender to the Babylonians. People didn't listen. Do you know what he did one time? He got a yoke. A big old wooden yoke that they use on ops. He began to walk around town carrying this big old wooden yoke on his shoulders. And again, we preach the same message. We need to surrender to the Babylonians. He didn't just preach it. He showed it, acted it out as well. Uh, Ezekiel the prophet did the same thing also. There are several examples where Ezekiel would do some kind of strange little things, but they had a message behind it. Ezekiel would cut his hair off with a sword and divide his hair up into three parts and burn some of it and cut up some of it and throw some of it in the wind. Or he would lay down on one side for 40 days and turn over and lay down on the other side for 390 days. And other people would walk by and say, what is this guy doing? What is he thinking? What is he trying to show us? Well, he's doing something we call symbolic action. Acting out 
your sermon. That's what Jesus was doing when he was riding the donkey into Jerusalem. But there is a third thing that I think is significant as well here. And that is that Jesus is riding a colt that had never been ridden before. In other words, this colt, in a sense, was devoted entirely to Jesus. It was, in a sense, uh, safe. In a sense, it was sort of set apart. It was holy so that Jesus could use it. No one else had used that colt. You know, if you look at the life of Jesus, you're going to see things that happen whereby no one else never did those things before, indicating that it was to be holy with reference to Jesus. Then he was born of a virgin, a woman that had never had marital relationships before. A baby had never broke through that womb before. In a sense, that becomes so holy. When Jesus died, he was placed in a new tomb. One that no one had ever put in before. In other words, that tomb was holy, special for him. And so he rides his stone. That's holy and special for him as well. Well, one other truth that comes out of this passage, and that is that his entrance is public. He doesn't try to sneak in. Like I said a little bit earlier, he comes in publicly on purpose. God's plan of salvation is going to be fulfilled just like God said, and Jesus is going to make sure it happens. And he's going to get these Jewish religious leaders involved in fulfilling God's plans and not their plans. Like I said a little earlier, they wanted to get him and park out. They wanted to get under and cut his throat or something, and hopefully nobody would ever know about it. But that wasn't going to happen. Jesus came in publicly. He rode publicly into Jerusalem. And I think as we think about what's going to happen here over the next few days, this little slide here is pretty helpful. Jesus entered Jerusalem in order to get to the cross. The way to the cross was through Jerusalem. Jesus had to do that. Now let's move on. The Bible tells us then in Luke chapter 19 and beginning at verse 35, then they brought him to Jesus, that is, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. Went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of Mount Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, they are, in a sense, rolling out the red carpet for Jesus. They began to throw their garments down on the road for him, and they began to lay these palm leaves down on the road for him as well and to wave in all of them. Now, what's interesting is that, that this doesn't mention them waving the palm leaves and not, neither does Luke's account refer to the people singing Hosanna to God in the highest. It doesn't talk about palm leaves. It doesn't talk about Hosanna. And yet we know that from Matthew's account and Mark's account and John's account, these were the very things that were done. Now, those two things that, interestingly enough, are not mentioned here, are both pretty significant. They're both pretty important. And the first one involves the palm leaf. We sometimes seem to think that waving the palm leaf is a symbol of peace. And there are individuals that think, oh, this is a time of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's coming into Jerusalem. He's coming to bring peace. And so we're going to wave these palm leaves as a symbol of peace. But what's interesting is that these palm leaves are not symbols of peace. In fact, they are symbols of deliverance from enemies, and especially from enemies from, uh, from about 100 years before this and all. If you were to get one of the coins from the Maccabean times, just before Jesus came, what you would find if you turn it over a lot of times on these coins, you would find images of palm leaves. And the reason for that is because they were symbols of deliverance. They were symbols of deliverance from an enemy. And instead of being peace, they were symbols of being delivered from someone that was trying to destroy you. So let's remember that. These palm leaves are symbols of deliverance, deliverance from enemies. But then there's that word Hosanna that's not mentioned here as well. We sometimes sort of 
naturally think Hosanna just means something that's that's a good expression, an expression of praise to God. But you know that this also has a, a militant meaning behind it as well. You know that the word Hosanna means basically Lord save or something along that line. But you know that that song, in fact, it is a song. It comes from Psalms 118, and there's a small little group of psalms that are called the Halal Psalms, and these psalms were used in special ways. Jewish boys being brought up learned the psalms. They learned the Halal, those a small number of psalms right around Psalms 116 to 118. They were also used in the temple worship, and they were used quite heavily during the uh, Passover time as well. But I think what's interesting about this expression, Hosanna, is about a hundred years before this, was one of the Maccabees, Simon Maccabee, by name, Maccabeus by name, when he had gone off and destroyed a Syrian army, when he marched his army back into Jerusalem, he was greeted with the song of Hosanna. Victory! We have victory now. You've delivered us from our enemies. So while we may think that these are indication symbols of praise or worship, and I guess today we can say they are, they are more in reality symbols of deliverance. Deliverance from enemies, squashing our enemies. Now, no doubt a large portion of the Jews during that time viewed their Messiah as a conquering hero. They viewed him as one who would run the Romans out of town and bring Israel back up on top of the world. Uh, power-wise. That's what they thought. They didn't stop and realize that they needed deliverance from sin. They didn't think they had a problem with sin. They had a problem with Rome. And they wanted to get Rome. And so there were those, perhaps many of them, who hoped that somehow, some way, Jesus would be the one who would deliver them from Rome and all. And so they are singing this hymn of deliverance. Deliver us from our enemies. But now let's move on. Bible continues in verse 39. Now, and some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, each rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. In every happy time that we endure, there's always somebody who wants to rain on our parade. You ever heard that expression before? Someone raining on the parade? That's almost happening literally here with Jesus coming down the mountain. While there were a lot of people there praising him, while there were a lot of people there excited and rolling out the red carpet for him, so to speak, there were also those ready to squash the happiness that these people were having. And it's the Pharisees. And the Pharisees say to Jesus, quiet this bob down. You're going to get us in big trouble. Don't you know that the Romans occupy us now? Perhaps they were looking back over their shoulder down in the city of Jerusalem. And there was the Tower of Antonia right next to the temple. In fact, it was higher than the walls of the temple, and it was a Roman fortress. And they had spies there watching everything going on in the temple and everything in and out of Jerusalem. Well, maybe these Pharisees were looked back up to that temple, and they warned Jesus, you are quiet. You're going to get us in big trouble here if you keep this up. But Jesus said, the time is here. We can't stop. And even if we were able to quiet these people, the stones are going to cry out because God's will is about to be done now. It's about to be accomplished. Well, we continue on in our story. In Luke 19, now beginning verse 41. Now, as he drew near, he saw the sin and wept over it, saying, if you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace, now these are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side, and level with you, and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave you, leaving you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now, the Lord has already made his way up the hill. He started down the hill. Now, I'm told that when you get to the western side of the Mount of Olives, as you're traveling, you're going through some, uh, some little patches of 
uh, farmland, and there's some tree on the side of it. So you don't have a good view what you're looking at until you reach a certain point and you kind of turn around the corner, and all of a sudden there is the whole city spread before you in all of its panoramic beauty and glory. And the Bible indicates to us that when Jesus saw the city, he broke down and just cried over what he was about to see. Now here's an artist's rendition of what the city of Jerusalem may have looked like at that time. And this may have been the very view right here that Jesus sees as he comes around the Mount of Olives, and all of a sudden there's all of Jerusalem in front of him. And the temple, of course, is this area right here in the very beginning. And I don't know how well you can see this in the back, but it's interesting, the scale, because the city of Jerusalem, the back part of it, rose up. And so you see all the stuff in the background because it's actually higher than the foreground here. And so you can see all of the city is there. When Jesus saw it, his compassion overcame him, and he began to cry. And the Greek for that word doesn't mean just little strings of tears coming down the cheeks. It means to sob audibly, to cry hard. Jesus cried for the people of Jerusalem because he knew what was going to happen. He knew what their immediate future held. He knew that in 40 years the Romans would come and destroy this people and destroy their town and destroy their, their temple. And everything they had lived for and loved would be taken away from them. And that just really got he broke his heart when he saw that. You know, two days after this, on Tuesday, he's again going to address the Jews, and he's going to basically say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stone the prophets, how often will I have taken you as a mother? Hen takes her chicks under her wings, and you would not. Jesus was compassionate and heartbroken when he saw the city of Jerusalem. He knew what was about to happen to him. Now, the Bible tells us that Jesus will ride the donkey into Jerusalem. And there's going to be one more thing he's going to do this day. One more little detail that's going to be interesting. It's going to lead us into our study tomorrow. Jesus is going to walk into the temple. Once he gets down there, he gets off the donkey. He walks into the temple. He looks around. And he doesn't say a word. He looks at the temple and turns, walks out. And he and his men will return back over the Mount of Olives, and they will spend the evening, Sunday night, somewhere in the vicinity of that church. Now, as we look at this story that we've gone through today, I think there's something there, there's some mentions there for all of us. There's a lesson in this for all of us tonight from the story that we learned from the Lord's royal entrance in Jerusalem. And that lesson that we need to learn from our study tonight is this. The lesson that we need to see is that we need a king. Some people don't think they do, but we need a king. Now, in reality, there, there are two things that we really need. We need a savior, and we need a king. And we need a king just as much as we need a savior. We need a savior because, obviously, we have a sin problem. We're not born with it. We don't inherit it. We don't have a sinful nature, but we still have a problem with sin. Quite often, sin is stronger than we are before we're a Christian. Sin controls us as well. We need help. We need someone who can help us overcome sin. And that's what Jesus is. Jesus is a Savior. But not only do we need a Savior, folks, we need Him. Now, the American people, I think, kind of don't like a king. We don't like the idea of needing a king because, you know, we're used to freedom. We're used to having a say in everything that we do and all. And so we don't think that we need a king. We don't want a king. We, we had a king one time, a fellow by the name of King George, a long time ago. We didn't like old King George. He taxed us without representation. And so we fought a rebellion against him and won our independence. Whenever we think of kings, we think of kings that kind of fit two categories. We think of kings as being evil dictators, kings that control, kings that are brutal and ruthless, and we have no life under them. We can barely even breathe under the, the obstacles and the weights they put before us. 
And we certainly don't want a king like that. But sometimes when we think of kings, we think of people that just are figureheads. They don't really have any power. They don't make any laws like the king of England or queen of England a few years ago. They don't make any laws in England. They're merely figureheads. And you see, we don't need anyone. We don't need a king that's brutal. We don't need a king that's ruthless, a king that's a dictator. And neither do we need a king that's nothing more than a mere figurehead. What we need is a king that's going to help us to get to heaven. In this little chart here, you're going to notice that the Savior, the Savior is the one who saves us. He's the one that puts us on the road of salvation, going toward heaven and the home of God. But the king is the one who keeps us on that road and helps us stay on that road. And his laws are there for our good. Now, the problem sometimes is even with us in the church, we don't like that as king. We like Jesus as our Savior, but we don't necessarily like Jesus as king. Because, you see, kings tell you what to do. And we don't want people telling us what to do. Oh, we want to be saved? There's no question about that. We want to be saved from our sins. But we get kind of tired of having to do everything Jesus said. Don't we sometimes like to still be in control of our lives? Don't we sometimes like to call the shots of our own lives? Do I have to obey Jesus in everything? Do I have to live for him every day? Did he come to church on Sunday morning? No. And maybe I come Sunday night and maybe even Wednesday I did that. No. Can I live for myself during the week as well and do what I want to do? Or do I have to have a king over me all the time as well? Well, the problem we have is as humans is that we're quite easily distracted. It's real easy to start walking on that straight and narrow pathway and find something getting your attention, something comes your way, something uh, causes you to look away, and the next thing you know, you have uh, drifted away. Some of the great writers of the Old Testament warned us about that. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 10 and verse 23, it is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. In Proverbs 14 and verse 12, there is a way that seems right to a man but its end is the way of death. That's why we need a king right here, folks. We can't direct our own steps in the ways that we take in, in death. We need someone to help us on that path to get us where we're going to go. Jesus' mother, one time, made a little statement that was actually kind of prophetic, in a sense. It kind of encapsulates everything that the Old New Testament is about. Remember the the, uh, the wedding feast of Cana, and they're running out of wine, and Jesus, or the other way, Jesus said, help me. They've got a problem. And Jesus said, you know, basically, I, I'm not here to do stuff like this. And I've come to advance the kingdom of God. But do you remember what she did after she talked to Jesus? She went to these servants, and she said this in John chapter 2, verse 5, whatever he says to you, do it. I think those words are perfect. Those are the words that we need to understand about our lives in serving Jesus. Whatever Jesus says, we need to do it. Whether we like it or not, we need to do it. We may think we have a better way of doing things. We may have really gone a different direction in our life. But whatever Jesus says to us, we need to do it. We need to obey him. And scripture is full of similar statements like this. In John 14 and verse 15, Jesus said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. In Luke 6, verse 46, Jesus said, Why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I tell you? And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says, For to this end I also wrote that I might put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. Not most things, not the things you like, not the ones that tickle your fancy. He says, You're to be obedient in all things. That means Monday morning when you get to go to work. You're serving Christ the King and you're obeying Him. That means that even if you're in a workplace that's full of ungodly people and unbelieving people, you don't lower your standards to be like them. You don't laugh at the jokes they tell. You don't laugh at the stories they tell. You set yourself apart for them. That means when you go to school on Monday morning, if you're a teenager or you're a child going to school, that means you don't fall prey to all that stuff those other kids do. You serve King Jesus every day. You serve Jesus whether it's easy or whether it's hard. 
He's your king. He's going to get you to heaven. He's the one that's going to help us stay on that straight and narrow. And if he's not the king of your life, you're going to stray. You're going to get lost. You're going to make a mistake and find yourself going the wrong way. I want to close with a simple little illustration here about the fact that Jesus is the king who sits on the throne in our hearts. In everyone's heart, there is a throne. That's why I've been in that cloth up here. But in every individual's heart, every one of you right now has a throne, figuratively speak, in your heart. And you know, someone or something sits on that throne. And whatever or whoever sits on that throne controls you. And since they are your king, you are their servant. Unfortunately, sometimes we allow self to sit on that throne. And when you allow self doing what you want to do, making yourself boss, when you allow self to sit on that throne, you're asking for big trouble in your life. Now, the Bible tells us that we ought to allow Jesus to sit on that throne. Now, you can't have both sitting on one throne. Self and Christ cannot sit on that same throne. It's not big enough. There's not enough room. And it's not going to work. And here's what happens when you allow self to sit on that throne in your heart. The Bible says this in Romans 6, verse 12. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its source. When you allow self to sit on your throne, that basically means that you yield to sin. You bow to to sin. Sin controls you. Scripture tells us that Christ needs to sit on our throne. And when Christ sits on that heart in our throne, Ephesians 3, 17 says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. So there's your option right there. Someone so will sit on that throne. It's either going to be self or it's going to be Christ. Now, when we recognize Christ is him, he that's on that throne, and he rules our life. And we're going to bring our study to a close there. Tomorrow night, Lord willing, we continue. And we're going to go to Monday. All of everything I've described to you today happened on Sunday. The next day, what's going to happen to Ruth? What's going to happen to Jesus the next day? What's Jesus going to do? Remember, he's gone into the temple. He's looked everything over, had said a word, walked away. What's going to happen next day when he comes back? Come back to Mark Eden, and we're going to talk about what happened to the Lord on Monday. We're going to see the King of the New House. If you're here tonight, and uh, Christian, we're going to sing our invitation song. It's an opportunity to come forward. They can make your request known to God and the church here about what you want to do with your life. You bet you're not a Christian. Bible teaches us in that situation that you need to obey the gospel. You need to become a child of God. Faith and repentance and confession of Christ and through baptism, you can be added to the Lord's church. You can be saved from your sins. That's what we want. Perhaps, as we mentioned, on that path toward heaven, you sort of strayed. You, know, you kind of rebelled against Jesus as being your king. Why not? Tonight, repent, come back to the Lord, repent of your sins, confess your wrongs, and pray for forgiveness. God will forgive you, and you'll be back on that path with Jesus as your King of Glory. If you're here this evening and you need the gospel, we invite you to come while we stand, while we stand.